Hey, welcome. I am here with uh, Jim Blair and Mark Heiner. And these are two two men that have a lot of experience with Social Security. Jim Blair um, has worked, his career was at Social Security Administration, and he retired several years ago. And uh, Mark is a CPA who several years ago kind of shifted his focus to specialize in Social Security as well. I get a lot of questions, right, as the financial planner uh, about Social Security, and we do a lot of Social Security planning. Um, probably the biggest question and the biggest concern people have really is the long-term stability of Social Security. And so maybe you could just address that, kind of give us the facts, and then maybe what you kind of see happening in the future. Let me just say one thing before I let Jim do his spiel on this topic. Social Security will always be there. A trillion dollars in taxes come in, that amount of money would be available to be paid out to uh, beneficiaries as benefits. Now, Jim, I'll let you take over. And I agree with that. It will always be there. Uh, will it look exactly like it does today? Probably not. There'll be some changes. But let's talk about the worst case scenario first. Yeah. And that is, if nothing is done, they make no changes to the program. What will happen is about 2034, the surplus that the Social Security Administration currently has will be gone. They will have used it to pay benefits, administer the program. And so by law, the Social Security Administration cannot operate in the red. And that means everybody's going to see a cut in benefits. That's projected to be about a 20% cut. We don't believe that will happen. Congress isn't going to let that happen. Uh, are you going to vote for somebody that gives you a 20% pay cut? Probably not. So their their concern always seems to be getting reelected. They won't allow that to happen. So we, we went through this before in the late 70s, early 80s. We were in the same spot we are now. And at that point, Congress and the president got together, made the changes they needed to make. And some of those changes affected anybody listening to to this today. And that's because... Uh, that's when they changed the full retirement age. It used to be 65. It's now been moved up to 67. There's a lot of people that are in between, but uh, currently the maximum full retirement age is 67. Now, that's likely to change. We hear a lot of talk about moving the full retirement age to age 70. The other day, I heard them talking about age 69. So it's going to go up somewhere uh, to a 69 to 70. My bet's still on 70. And does that mean you can't file 62? No, not necessarily. I haven't heard where they're going to change the initial filing date. But if they move that full retirement age to 70, that'll be a pretty significant cut at age 62. So it'll be something people will have to decide if that's what they want to do or not. But they're looking at changing probably the full retirement age. They're going to change what we pay taxes on. This year, if you earn uh, over $168,600, you stop paying the Social Security tax. They're going to raise that. Yeah. There's some talk of raising it to $250,000. There's some talk about saying, okay, we'll still cut it off at that one sixty eight six. But if you earn over $400,000, it kicks back in. So it's going to hit our higher earners, and they're going to pay more in. Now, if they do that, under the current law, that means they'll receive a higher benefit, which means we'll be right back in the same spot a few years down the road. That's where means testing will probably come in. And that will be in the form of, without getting too much in the weeds, uh, the higher earners will probably see where they receive less uh, of a benefit each month in the future than they would based on current law. Whereas the lower earners, People basically that earn less than the maximum each year, their benefits will probably stay about the same. Uh, it be the calculation will remain the same. So we do see changes coming. It's just unfortunately it's going to be later rather than sooner. We prefer sooner rather than later, but we don't make the change. So, right, and and with just a couple of those changes you just mentioned, that would sure up Social Security for a long time. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, they feel that the change in the full retirement age and raising the uh, the amount you pay the tax on 
would take care of about 98% of the deficit for the next 75 years. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that works out. Uh, it never works out as long as they think they would, but it would, it would definitely change it for the near future uh, and into the kind of distant future uh, that we can see. So I do believe those changes will be made and people will continue to receive their full benefit. Okay. Well, that's great. By the way, welcome to the Financial Fast Lane YouTube channel. My name is Lane Martinson. If you're new to this channel, we would invite you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. We really do appreciate that. So t tell me, um, you get a lot of questions. What would you say are some of the the big questions that you get or maybe the most frequent um, and maybe even th the biggest mistakes you see people making? Well, let me maybe, Jim, address one of the biggest mistakes people do make. They assume that the nice, smiling faces the local Social Security office will provide them guidance in terms of what their Social Security options are. However, though, the, mat the fact of the matter is, when Jim Blair worked at SSA, there are about 85,000 employees. That's closer to about 60,000. So let's just say we've had 20,000 people leave with Jim Blair's experience. He worked there for 35 years. So if somebody goes down to Social Security and they say, hey, what are my options? Well, they're going to look at you like a deer looks in the headlights. The, uh, representatives have been directed by their boss, the commissioner in Baltimore, not to review options with folks. Their job in life is to take your application. So uh, a myth is that the nice folks at SSA will help guide you in terms of what your Social Security options are. Right. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're not even allowed, right, to give financial advice, correct? That's correct. And and that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Uh, because all they know about is what your Social Security is. Right. They don't know, are you eligible for a pension uh, from somewhere else? And if so, how much? They don't know how much you have in savings. Uh, that's something that I think folks need to discuss with their financial advisors because they can look at uh, all the savings they have. They know what their other pensions are. And then it, hopefully the advisor knows about Social Security. Maybe the smart ones have taken our class and have the NSSA cer certification like you did. But, you know, uh, the so people at the Social Security office don't have access to all that information. Right. And you don't want that person giving you advice if you should file 62 for retirement age or 70. That being said, if there are, there are options, it wouldn't hurt for them to let you know what the various options are, and then they could take that information to their financial advisor. That's what we do when we work with people. We give them the Social Security options they have available, and hopefully they take that to their financial advisor, and then they will figure out what's the best for them. Yeah. Yeah, and I see that as a, a big problem where People they kind of they think of Social Security as one thing, and they'll maybe talk to Social Security Administration, and and then they're not coordinating that with taxes and their in their, you know all the other income planning that goes into that. And there's that's where I see a lot of mistakes. And so it's really that holistic approach uh, can make a huge difference from what I see. And what we do. and Lane, let me also add one of the big mistakes or questions that advisors have from their clients is, well, should I wait to 870? We all know that you get your maximum benefit if, if you wait to 870. We also know that if you claim at 62, that's basically the early, early stage somebody could file for. To begin, they're going to have the lowest benefit at that point. So, Jim, how many folks on a percentage basis wait until 870 to begin their benefits? It's a pretty small percentage. Uh, it's around somewhere between 5 to 7% of folks wait till age 70. Now, that doesn't mean that some folks aren't waiting past full retirement age. It's just they're not waiting all the way to age 70. Yeah. And as Mark mentioned, 70 is when you receive the most amount of money. Your benefit at age 70 compared to age 62, it's about 75% higher. Now, that sounds pretty good. That's the good news. But there's always bad news that goes along with it. And the bad news is you have to wait eight years to yeah. get that benefit. So yeah. giving up benefits for eight years, how long does it take you to make that up? And it's, uh, depending on the individual, somewhere between 10 to 12 years 
so somewhere between 80 and 82, you receive the same amount of money from Social Security, whether you filed at 62 or you waited until age 70. Uh, waiting from 62 to full retirement age is also about a 12-year break-even point, but that means you break even about 78 to 79, depending on your full retirement age. Uh, but thanks for folks to take into consideration. Yeah. And Lane, I'd like to add to that when Jim Blair does an analysis and a, provides a consultation with clients, because we do consulting, uh, Jim will look at the family unit <laughs> and, and not just an individual husband or wife. Family unit would normally be husband, wife. Maybe you need to factor them, seeing some young kids. Maybe there is a, da- a disabled adult child to factor in. Quite possibly somebody was a, a surviving spouse. You need to figure that in also. And also you need to factor in something else. And I forgot what it was. I, I'm 68 years old now, uh, Lane. My memory's not what it used to be. So a very, co- oh, public employees, that's what it was. So if, if husband or wife worked for the government or hired by, uh, state, local, or county government, or hired by uh, in a federal job before 1984, then public employee reductions may come to play. Those are the WEP and GPL things we need to talk about. Yep. Uh, so if we have husband and wife and they're both eligible for their own benefits, many times we'll suggest, well, we never really suggest, let, let me, we guide. Uh, many times the, the wife may decide with our guidance to take her benefits as early as she can, maybe as early as age 62. That might allow the husband to wait until his floor would terminate or as late as age 70 to begin his benefits. So the wife takes her early, which is assuming for now, I don't want to get any hate mail, that she was the, she was the, the lower earner. And so she'll take early and maybe he could wait until his full retirement until age 70 to claim his benefit. And quite possibly, if she's eligible for a spousal boost off, his re- off of his record, when he claims, she'll get that spousal boost added to her Social Security benefit. Right, right. And so, just one point that I think is misunderstood. That now, as far as the spousal benefit goes, this if there's this, whether it's the full spousal benefit or the boost, uh, if they have their own record, um, if they claim it's going to be fifty percent of what the spouse, the, the earnings, the higher earning spouse's full retirement benefit is, correct? Correct. Uh, I know there's no delayed retirement credits that apply to the spousal benefit, right? And that is correct. So if higher earner waits until 870 and gets all those DRCs, delayed retirement credits, the spousal benefit is still based on the higher earner's full retirement age benefit. Another name for that is PIA, primary yeah. insurance amount. That's the amount of benefits somebody's eligible for at their full retirement age. Right. Okay, so here's a, here's another question. Let's say we have the higher earning spouse that, that, that claims their benefits early. Uh-huh. And then this, this, the, the other, you know, the spouse that's going to be getting the spousal benefit waits until their full retirement age. Are they, is, is that spousal benefit going to be based off the full retirement benefit of the earning, higher earning spouse? Or is it going to be reduced because the higher earning spouse started benefits early? Jim? It, it's not reduced because the higher earner took their benefit at 62. Uh, if the, the lower earning spouse waits until their full retirement age, they'll still receive 50% of the higher earner's PIA or benefit at their full retirement age. So as Mark mentioned before, they don't see an increase if they wait to age 70. The spousal benefit is an increase. But on the other side of the coin, it's not decreased because the higher earner took their benefits at age 62. As long as the spouse waits until their full retirement age. Right. And that's what it's based off of. Now, that being said, taking benefits early or waiting until age 70 does affect survivor benefits. So if the, uh, the higher earner 
takes a benefit at 62 and receives a reduced benefit, that means the survivor benefit will be reduced if the spouse that survives them is going to be stepping into their shoes and receiving their benefit. Likewise, if they wait till 70, that increases the survivor benefit. That's another area people forget about, or maybe they just don't want to think about. Nobody wants to think about their own demise, but you need to take that into consideration. How important are survivor benefits in your planning? And if that's a big part of your plan is that if my spouse survives me, and she's going to receive my Social Security, and it's important that she receive as much as possible, that means I need to wait as long as possible. Doesn't necessarily mean 70, but as long as what's good for me, yeah. uh, I should wait as long as possible to take my benefit. Right. Yeah. Very good. Um, t- let's talk a little bit about WEP and pensions. That's that's also something people are confused about. Uh, so who who does it apply to? Who does it not? How does that work? Yeah, WEP and GPO, that's uh, two provisions that apply to people who are eligible for a pension from work, not covered by Social Security. Now, in a lot of states, that would be your state teachers. A lot of those folks pay into state teachers' retirement, but they don't pay into Social Security. It could be your police or your firemen. They pay into their own pension plan. In Ohio, 97.5% of our state, local, and county employees pay into a different pension plan. They don't pay into Social Security. They're affected by windfall uh, and potentially affected by government pension offset. Those two provisions pretty much affect all types of benefits. Windfall means that if you have enough work under other types of employment where you've paid into Social Security and you're eligible for a Social Security benefit, then that benefit's going to be less because of your non-covered pension. Uh, you will see a reduction. Windfall elimination provision uh, lowers your own Social Security benefit, whereas government pension offset affects spousal benefits, ex-spousal benefits, or survivor benefits. It's a benefit you're drawing from somebody else's work record. And unlike windfall, where you're going to receive something that never completely wipes out your own Social Security benefit, government pension offset can and oftentimes will completely eliminate a monthly benefit for someone. Now, they can still get Medicare from their spouse. That isn't eliminated, but they're not going to receive a monthly benefit. And that's why uh, market came up with the term for GPO instead of government pension offset. It's more of a grumpy partner offset because who's not grumpy when you find out you're not going to receive anything from your spouse? Uh, But it's still the official name's government pension offset. And that of there's always talk. There's talk right now that they're going to eliminate both of those in Congress. I wouldn't hold my breath. Yeah, yeah. He might cross your years. fingers, but he won't hold your breath. Yeah, well, I'll cross my fingers until I have to write something. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're always hopeful, but it's I, I I'd say the odds of that happening are pretty slim. Yeah. So an example is would be let's say a, a teacher or a, let's say a police officer. They paid into this state pension. They retire at age 50, and then they really start another career. They work for more than 10 years. So they've been paying into Social Security for 10 years. But then because of the prior pension, that that Social Security is significantly reduced, right? And and then the spousal benefit is almost or or just completely eliminated, right? Right. The the Social Security retirement could be reduced. Uh, uh, around five hundred and eighty dollars, uh, but it's still at no point ever going to completely eliminate the retirement benefit. Government pension offset means they're going to take two thirds of your non covered pension and subtract it from your Social Security benefit. Oftentimes, that completely eliminates it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, a divorce situation and claiming a spousal benefit from a former spouse. Um, you just got to recap the rules for us. So Jim, I'll, I'll do this one. So let's have a little fun. Let's assume I'm married. I'm actually single. I'm trying, but uh, <laughs> let's assume, well, let's just, no, wait, let's assume I'm divorced. That's really what I meant to yeah. say. Yes. The question. So for my ex-spouse to collect off my work record, she must be at least age 62. 
She must be single. We must be married for at least 10 consecutive years. And I must be receiving a Social Security benefit. That's either a retirement or a disability benefit. So, to recap, my ex-spouse must be 62. She must be at least 62, that is. She must be single. We must be married for 10 consecutive years. And I must be receiving a Social Security disability or retirement benefit. So, there's a little control there. What if I want to wait to age 70 so I have a new spouse? And I want to maximize my benefit to my uh, uh, new wife. Well, then my ex-wife won't be able to collect off me until I turn my benefits on at age 70. However, there is another rule out there. Uh, It's called independently entitled divorced spouses. If both exes have been divorced for at least two years and both exes are at least age 62, then... uh, well, let's say it's me and my wife, my ex-spouse. Uh, we're both at least age 62, and we've been divorced for at least two years. She can collect off my work record regardless of me receiving a Social Security benefit. So divorce less than two years, I must be receiving, and divorce for two years or longer, that requirement goes away, and she, she can collect off me as long as we're both at least age 62. Now, The amount is still the same. It's still half of the high earner's PIA. So if my PIA or full retirement age benefit is $2,000, my ex-spouse can draw $1,000 off my work record. And if she's under full retirement age, it's reduced her age. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And so now I know sometimes there's there's kind of an incentive. Let's say someone's been divorced or, yeah, so so they've been divorced. And they're they're now considering remarriage, but they don't give up that spousal benefit. And so they there's an incentive to not get married, right? Uh, up until I believe it's age sixty. Is that right, Jim? Well, not for divorce spouse benefits. The age sixty rule only applies to uh, surviving divorce spouse benefit. So if you're dis- if your ex spouse is deceased and you remarry after attaining age 60, you'll still continue to receive those benefits. But regardless of your age, if your ex-spouse is still living, and we're not encouraging anybody to do anything, but if your ex-spouse is still living, then a remarriage will terminate the divorce spouse benefits. Now, there is a rule, though, in place that if your current spouse, your new spouse, is receiving Social Security, and you could be eligible off of their work record. Normally, you have to be married to someone for 12 months or more to be eligible for a spousal benefit. But they, if your surviving divorce or your divorce spouse benefit terminates because of your remarriage, as long as you could immediately file on your new spouse, you could do that and you don't have to wait the 12 months. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, another area the wiki questions on has to do with disability insurance and you know we do retirement planning and so um when disability comes into play it's there's a whole another set of rules that come into play right um could you just kind of recap the differences and then and then at what point the disability benefit is is considered re- the retirement benefit at, at a certain age right yeah disability can be at any age so you don't have to be 62 or older or anything. You, you, a lot of younger folks receive disability. Uh, there is a work requirement involved with Social Security disability. Uh, and basically, you had to work five out of the last 10 years before becoming disabled. And what Social Security is going to look at for someone's disability, are you unable to work and earn what they call substantial gainful activity, SGA, for 12 months or more? or is your disability expected to result in death? And if the answer to either one of those is yes, you can be eligible for Social Security disability benefits. Mm -hmm. And they will pay you as long as you're disabled up until either you pass away or you reach your full retirement age. Now, what happens at full retirement age is they just convert your benefit to retirement benefits. Your payment's the same, your payday's the same, 
Uh, it just means it comes out of the retirement trust fund instead of the disability trust fund. So the person really doesn't see any difference. Um, it, it just switches over to the type of benefit. But disability is payable uh, to someone under full retirement age. There's no reduction for age. Uh, you receive 100%. They make a what they call a disability PIA. Uh, they're going to look at your age to determine how many years of earnings they're going to use in the calculation, but they'll determine what your benefit's going to be, and then that's what you receive. They won't reduce it for age at that point. Um, so disability is definitely there for folks who are un unable to work uh, yeah. and uh, for at least 12 months or more. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, last topic, um, taxes on Social Security benefits. Is that an area where you kind of defer or uh, I, I assume the Social Security Administration doesn't really say much about that, right? Um, to tell me a little bit about the taxes on Social Security benefits. Well, all Social Security is going to tell you is you can have taxes withheld from your benefit. And there's a form, it's a W-4V, like involuntary. Uh, and you just pick a percentage that you want. Uh, yeah, up to 22%. Up to 22%. Yeah. Uh, the the thing that Social Security tells their employees to talk about with so with taxes, call IRS yeah. because you don't want to give out any advice and it'd be wrong because now you're uh, liable for some of that. And I'll let Mark address the rest of it. And what we tell clients if they want to have a, a definitive uh, tax answer and calculation done, they need to reach out to their tax preparer. Uh we understand the general issues relating to taxation of benefits, like if you're filing a joint tax return with your spouse and your provisional income does not exceed $32,000, then none of your benefits are taxable. If your provisional income is between thirty-two and 44000 up to 50% will be might be taxable. And if your provisional income exceeds 44000 then up to 85% of your benefits may be subject to income tax. That's basically, basically all we're able to do when we meet with the client. And then Jim will say, reach out to your tax preparer for a better answer than that. Uh, so the question is, you know, I, I mentioned provisional income. What is provisional income? Well, you start out with the adjusted gross income before any social security benefits at all. And you add back some fun stuff. Uh, the most popular fun add back is the tax exempt interest income. So AGI minus benefits plus tax exempt interest income equals your modified adjusted gross income or Maggie. And to that, you add one half of your social security benefits to come up with your provisional income. And then you just look at the chart that kind of we were, Kai was referring to just a few minutes ago. But the problem with uh, these uh, income levels that I just uh, gave out to you folks is that they are not indexed for inflation, Lane. So every year, more and more of clients and, or so, and Social Security beneficiaries will pay income tax on their benefits. You know, I'm in that boat. Right. I pay taxes on my benefits. I'm saying also the... the, the, the uh, Dollar levels are a bit less for me, but still, every passing year, I pay more and more taxes on my benefits because these dollar amounts are not indexed for inflation. Right. Yeah. I um I do have one more question Go for regarding, regarding the earnings limit. Okay. Uh, many people have a lot of confusion around that subject, where they want to keep working, they want to claim early, and maybe invest the the social security payment while they're still working, but that er earnings limit becomes an issue. So c could you address that and kind of tell us how that works? Yeah, that applies to folks who file for social security and are still working who are under their full retirement age. And this year, 2024, if you earn over $22,320, social security is going to hold back $1 of your benefits for every $2 you go over. So depending on the amount of earnings you have, you may not be eligible for anything because they're going to withhold it all. Yeah. Um, or they may withhold half of it or, or part of it. So you have to be a little careful and look at it from the perspective 
of if I go ahead and take it, it's going to be reduced for age. How much am I going to receive? But then how much is Social Security going to withhold? Now, there is some good news in there, and that is any month that Social Security withholds any of your benefits because of your earnings, they'll adjust your reduction factor and give you an increase in benefits when you reach full retirement age. But the earnings test does apply. Now, the year you reach full retirement age, the amount you're allowed to earn goes up to $59,520, and then it's a one for three reduction. Yeah. But the one thing that's, that folks on Social Security are getting ready to take Social Security don't understand is they look at your earnings January through December. Mm-hmm. Even if you were not going to start your Social Security till July, they're going to look at the whole year. And what they do is to keep you from being penalized because maybe you go over the 22320 by the end of, of June and you stop work in July, it, is it fair to have your benefits withheld because of your earnings before you started your benefits? And what Social Security would say, any month that you earn $1,860 or less, we'll pay you anyway. So there is a monthly part of that, but that's only available in one year. Yeah. So it really creates unpredictability, right? Because it does. It'll turn it off and turn it back on and yeah. Okay, well, I, let me say, it's better to let Social Security know as early as you can about your earnings. If if you decide not to tell them, you're not, you're not going to get away with anything because once your earnings are posted to your work record, they will be more than happy to send you a letter saying you've been overpaid. So let Social Security know as early as possible what your anticipated earnings will be. Yeah. Because it could take them quite a while to catch up, right? I mean, are they, I don't know how responsive they are to, to that, but um, anyway. Hey, I think I'm, I think we're over the over time here a lot, of, but um, I really appreciate both of you sharing your experience and, and knowledge. Um, any final things that you would say regarding Social Security that, that our listeners would be maybe interested in? I'll start and then I'll, jam, I'll let you finish. Is that fine? Okay. Yes. Your listeners just need to be aware that what they might hear from a neighbor or at a, a cocktail party does not, those strategies and advice probably will not uh, relate to them. So if, if you're at a cocktail party and you hear uh, a husband or a wife talking about when they began their benefits and that the earnings test was not an issue and that they didn't tell Social Security that they were a public employee, don't take that as gospel. You need to do what's right. It's 75 million baby boomers are out there, Lane, and they all have their their own different set of social security options and claiming strategies. So everybody is different. Jim Blair, he can meet with 10 different married couples, and they will all have a different set of social security options to consider. Now, Jim, I'll let you finish. Yeah, and just because you're 62 doesn't mean you should go out and apply. Uh, for some folks, that's that's a good age to apply. Most folks, it isn't. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is plan for when you want to take your Social Security. We plan for everything. We plan our vacations. We plan weddings, maybe divorces. But people will plan way in advance for a lot of things. Well, Social Security is a lifetime benefit that you're going to receive the rest of your life. Why not take the time to plan in advance? You have a year to change your mind. That's the easy part. The hard part is if you change your mind, Social Security wants all the money back they paid you. So it's better to decide in advance what it is you want to do. Uh, Take the time to look at it. Make sure you create your online account through the ssa.gov website. Uh, That way you can look at your benefits statement and it gives you a great, uh, it's a great planning tool, shows you what your benefits are looking like at various ages from 62 to 70. And you can make those plans. So just just plan. That's the biggest thing, I think. Thank you. And he, here at my firm, um, Martins and Wealth Management, we, we actually have a professional social security analysis report. It's a nominal fee, $29, and it's a comprehensive plan that we do, uh, we provide as well. So, well, thank you very much, um, Jim and Mark. Uh, very, very grateful for the time. And uh, until next time. Lane, thank you for the opportunity. We enjoyed it also. Yeah, thanks, Lane. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.